Francisco, I used to go every year and uh, I wanted to have something to sell. And I didn't have a book and I just didn't, ha I didn't have enough time to do a graphic novel. I didn't think I was good enough. Um, and so uh, we put together a flight and it just kind of came together organically. Um, it started as a little black and white Kinko's thing that we were going to do. And then it just kept growing and growing and <laughs> it got kind of out of control. Um, and I was seeing some amazing comics come in, and I ended up having to quit my job when my my, my company partners I was a I was um, I was working in an animation studio. They they uh, wanted me to commit a little bit more to the work that I was doing there. And I, I saw these comics come in, and I said, you know, I if it's either, if I have to choose this or that, um, I'm going to have to just quit and find a publisher for this uh, because I can't imagine letting these guys down. And so I ended up just quitting, and then I just figured, oh, I'll just go back to animation. I was just going to go and direct an animated film or something. <laughs> uh, I'd come back and be a story artist somewhere. That's what I thought. Um, but after I took the leap um, away from animation to work on flight, um, I, I was working on Daisy Cutter at the time, and I decided, uh, you know what? I think I can. I might be able to do this. And I did Daisy Cutter for no money. I did flight for no money. I actually paid to do flight, you know. Um, mm. And um, and then uh, Amulet came along. And it's been, I mean, this has been a huge success uh, for, for us, for me, anyway, as a comic book. The books have sold, you know, really well. And it's actually, you know, providing for me and a staff of uh, uh, five or six people right now uh, wow. to, to work on these. So I kind of think of Amulet as like the next version of Flight, <laughs> a, a focus vision team project. I just like working in a team. I think that's what it comes down to. I just want to work with a lot of other artists that I enjoyed, uh, whose company I enjoyed. Um, and flight was the beginning of that. Amulet's the next step of that, you know. So we'll see where we go from there. So that's actually how it's all organic. I, I had no real plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, something beautiful came together out of no plan, you know. Like, like you know, you didn't expect it to be this big. You you managed to quit your job. Yeah, that, and that's I, awesome. And I met I met some of the most amazing people, you know, through flight. And I actually got to know my wife through flight. You know, so did you meet your wife on like you like no, you no, had no. your we, first date? No, we, we've known each other before before the books, and she and I, I kept inviting her to be a part of it, but she didn't feel she was good enough, <laughs> so she would she'd actually turn it down a few times, and then finally she decided to do a story on the it was actually in the second book, and then she did a story in the, the fourth book, which I think is actually one of the best flight stories we ever had. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, well you, you know, thank you guys for enlightening us a little bit more about the specifics of your book. Mm -hmm. I want to move past anthologies for a little bit and talk about comic books in general mm -hmm. and the comic book industry in general for a bit. Um, you know, it seems like every like week, you know, we go on the internet and you read a story about like, oh, comic books are dying. People aren't buying comic books. This is like a weird little inside medium of only like thir like like white thirty five year old dudes live in their parents' basements. You know, like 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 you know. I'm not happy about it. I'm just talking about the media perception. <laughs> That's what I, anytime I insult someone, I just go, no, it's the media perception. <laughs> not me. Um, now, uh, in general, what can you, what, what do you think that the comics industry can be doing that it's not doing to kind of reclaim the spotlight that it might have in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? And I'll throw that over to the whole panel. You know, what, are, what could the comic book industry be doing better right now? Yeah, what aren't we doing right? Passing it on. Yeah, it's getting the yeah. word out. No, well, passing it on to the kids. Oh. Well, I mean, what do you mean by that? Well, we all fell in love with comics as kids. That's and true. a lot of comic artists forget that. Yeah. And so, but they, they, so they constantly make stuff. I mean, a lot of people would give, artists will give each other advice and they'll say, oh, you just got to write for yourself. Mm -hmm. What they're failing to realize is that you, you yourself, you're growing and getting older. Right. <laughs> And sometimes you forget that you actually, you yourself were once 10 years old and you fell in love with these things. And I, I feel like the industry doesn't seem to understand those kids anymore. And it, the, the kids feel like they've, the industry has left them, you know? Um, and so I actually started doing Amulet. I actually took a, uh, I, I was doing comics that were made for 20, 30 year olds, you know? Daisy Cutter is very much in that vein. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I decided not to do Daisy Cutter 2 and to focus on Amulet. I said, you know what, there's a hole here. There's just not enough great all-ages comics that, you know, that actually play to an, an older audience, too. Like, I wanted to get, you know, comic readers involved in Amulet, but also I wanted them to feel comfortable passing it on to their kids and sharing it with somebody. Mm. You know, because a, a lot of the stuff that I, I did um, with Copper, my, my webcomic, my webcomic I sold prints on my site, and I knew that people were buying the prints as gifts to somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so you don't, you actually don't treat yourself very well 
but you're willing to spend money for somebody else. That's a, that's a, that's a very good point, actually. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I just thought, well, how about I make comics for comic lovers just like me who have kids. <laughs> yeah. And they'll want to pass it on to them and share it. And then they can share their love for the comics. You know, and I, I, that's that's really that's been what I've been working on for like the last ten years. And I I, I would I, I don't really care so much what the industry does, honestly, because <laughs> if they don't figure it out, there's no, I can't change anybody. Yeah. You know, if if somebody wants to do a certain thing, it's their prerogative. They should just go ahead and do the way do it the way they want to do it. You know, Marvel and DC can do the things that they do. You know. Um, I also, well, if I were to be critical, and you know, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. Dirt, blood. Let's do this. Um, I wish the bigger publishers um, treated their artists and their writers like partners ah. instead of work for hire. Okay. You know, because um, right now I think they, they spend less time working on developing new content um, with the creators because the creators are just afraid to like create their own stuff and, and then have it be taken away from them. You know, comics have a history of basically getting like, a comic artist basically getting their stuff taken from them. <laughs> yeah, no, because absolutely. They're, so because they're un yeah. and, and it's partly the artist's fault because they're uninformed and they sign bad contracts. You know, and it goes all the way back to Superman. You know, Siegel and Schuster, Jack Kirby. He gets he gets nothing for creating pretty much all of Mar right <laughs> of Marvel. Right, everything. Right? Now, now I want I want to throw it out to the rest of you guys. Uh, we got two questions on the table. One. What can the industry be doing to sell more books, just in general? And then, and then two. I think that you raised a pretty good point, you know, about how we treat creators. I know an image yeah. that they they treat their creators pretty well, you know. And you're running your own shop at Woman Anthology, you know, like uh, like what can we do to treat the artists and the writers better? Either one of those questions to the three of you guys. Well, I think uh, comics used to be a lot. Be a little louder, please. Get closer to the sorry. Comics used to be a lot more fun. Um, now it's it seems like everything's dark and more adults oriented. It's kind of leaving a lot of people behind. Mm -hmm. um, also, it's 90% superheroes. And I love superheroes, but I don't just love superheroes. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to see a lot more variety pushed out there and pushed hard. Uh, because, you know, most everything, it, when you go to a comic store, it's Marvel and DC and then maybe 10% of uh, Image and Dark Horse. And, then that's about it. Yeah, it's like Marvel and DC and then like the weird rap. Right. I know what you're talking about. So I think digital's going to start to level that playing field a little bit. Um, and I think that's a great place for singles to go because $3.99 for a 22-page or 20-page story, it's it's too much. Yeah. It's just, it's way too much. Yeah. And you can't expect a kid to plop down like half their allowance or their whole allowance on one book. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know what else we can do other than uh, diversify, remember the fact that, you know, this isn't just for adults, you know, as much as you, we want to see Spider-Man grow up and have kids and whatever else, you know, that 12-year-old's not going to read that. No, you're, um, so. I think you're absolutely right, you know. But when I was 12, Spider-Man did get married, and I still have that issue. <laughs> no, but I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, big thing is remembering that um, all ages doesn't mean kids. You know what I mean? Like, I, I always think of it something like Doctor Who. A TV show. I love it. Uh, 34, little kids love it. And I think there need to be more comics that have that kind of feel. Where they can tell kind of, you know, stories that can be enjoyed by every age and every generation. I think, uh, and I think superheroes, for the most part, should be those kinds of stories. Personally. They, they used to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, I, mm -hmm. and there's some, even, you know, there's some stuff that I read now I just think, I, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not appropriate to kids. And, uh, and it's not... Such a big deal as an adult that I'd be upset if like there wasn't blood and guts in this comic. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so yeah, yeah I, just, I think that they just need to look for a broader audience. But they do make what sells. I don't know. I mean, they, there are a lot of really great kids comics that don't sell, and I don't know what to do about that except get the word out. And you know, kids have so many different uh, things to do now. You know what I mean? I mean, like the video games and stuff. But um, but often I feel like the kids comics that don't sell. When I read those particular books, they feel like. Um, the artist or writer is treating the kids like they're they're not they're not small adults. Yeah. I, I, there's this condescending. I mean, they're speaking down to the kids. Not necessarily speaking down, but it, it, maybe they're afraid of kids. I don't know what it is. You know, there's just this sense that I don't feel like there's a connection. Like they don't understand that audience. Yeah. You no, know? Nicole, Nicole, what do you have to say? Um, I agree with the kid statement. Um, this is actually going to be more business oriented. 
So I believe the reason why there was such a shift to manga, particularly in American culture, is because that is what appeals to that age group. Manga appeals to children. And we are dying as an industry because the teen generation, who are as our target audience right now, likes things for free. But children, their parents buy their stuff. And so that actually should be our target audience. And Dark Horse does amazing for itself as an independent. I mean, they're just flawless at because they treat their creators well. They, tr they work together. But even Dark Horse doesn't have a solid kids comic. I think we do need that. And my cousin and I are actually working on something because we're discussing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and we just miss that. I mean, the thing about I miss the Ninja Turtles every day. <laughs> and every time they've remade it, it still doesn't have that raw, innocent feel of going out for pizza after kicking butt. No. And innocently kicking butt. Everybody's trying to return to gritty, but people are going to get real tired of that real fast because once everything's gritty, it just all looks the same. That's called gray. Yeah. No, I know what you're talking about. Well, was just specifically for the Ninja Turtles, I remember being a kid and grabbing, like, the original Eastman Laird comic. Yeah, I was going to say, then, that's, that's the ironic thing. Right, the and, then it, and then it was like, there. I remember, like, seeing, like, a subway robbery, and then Raphael, I remember him saying, I'm pretty sure I can hit that guy in the neck with my side. And I was like, he's not going to flip page, sigh through guy's neck. I'm like, oh, my Lord, Jesus. <laughs> but that was okay, because afterwards you got together Cowabunga Pizza. That was what you loved. I mean, yeah, it was high stress situations. I mean, I, we even loved the movies growing up. And yeah, the first Ninja Turtles movie is really dark. You know, like <laughs> yeah. it opens up with April O'Neil getting like mugged on, yeah. the, on the subway platform again, you know? But yeah. it was okay because kids like that. I understand exactly what you're talking yeah. about. They're treating them like children, which children look up to adults. They want the same stuff adults do, they just want it in a different way. And I think we do need to reconnect with our children because teenagers are a dead market. They're going to be tweeting, they're going to be pirating, they're going to be doing everything for free. Get the people who will still spend money and also the people you want to inspire to go on and do this if you have something that's not interested stop trying to pitch to it you're not going to understand it because it's a completely different generation than us and i'm glad i don't understand that generation <laughs> they sting <laughs> well, right the, the kids will be adults in a few years too i mean yeah. exactly. they grow up really fast yeah. yeah yeah now 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 digital is something that's come up a couple of different times i want to talk about by the digital space like I can understand, you know, digital for a single issue, you know, or even like digital only comics. But what are your guys' plans? And let's start with you, sir, uh, for your anthologies. Is there going to be a digital edition? What's that going to be priced as? How is it going to be distributed if you're going to do it? Or if you're not going to do it, why does that not interest you? Um, <clears throat> I don't know what uh, the digital plan is yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'd kind of like to get it on uh, the uh, Apple Bookstore for iPad. Because um, I. Uh, the, the current companies like Comixology and Graphically, they don't really do uh, bigger graphic novels. They're more about the singles. Right. So if I can get something at the Apple Bookstore and price it accordingly, I think I can uh, do pretty well with it and get some of these guys working with me uh, some money. Um, beyond that, I, I don't know. Um, a lot of people are trying new things. They're trying... Because um, there's a lot you can do with digital. You can layer the artwork so that you can take away the color and see what the, the artwork looks like just in ink or just in pencil. And, uh, you can translate it easily. It's uh, There's a lot you can do with digital that uh, is still being explored and everybody's still trying to figure it out. So I'm kind of waiting and seeing a little bit. But um, yeah, Outlaw should be online pretty soon. 